Okay, I hope you, hope you all enjoyed your break and beautiful lunch. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Catherine McAlpine from AFDO. She's the manager of the Disability Loop project, and she will be talking about some NDIS readiness stuff. Thank you, Melissa, and many thanks to Daru for having me back. Um, I'm delighted to be here again today. Uh, could I start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we meet and acknowledge um, their elders past and present? Um, I'd also like to apologise in advance because at functions like this, I tend to get overly enthusiastic about what I'm talking about and then I start talking too fast. Um, and as you know, long-term habits are very hard to break. So can I encourage the interpreters or anyone else who needs me to slow down to not be shy? Because I genuinely am trying, but it seems to be about halfway through, I get immersed in the content and I um, forget my good intentions. So uh, please do say so. Um, so I'm from the Australian Federation of Disability Organisations. I think you probably all know who we are. Um, so we're an organisation made up primarily of people with disability and family members and our board is also primarily made up of people with disability. And the big project that we've been working on for the last two years is the NDIS Information Loop Project, which is the Disability Loop Project. Um, and I see some familiar faces in the crowd who have come to some of our workshops um, there. And that project uh, technically um, completed in November last year. Uh, but I did want to just mention it because we are about to release some summary reports from that project. Oh, it's the beginning of my show and tell. So we will soon um, produce three summary reports, uh, one on the NDIS resources, so the Disability Loop website itself and associated social media, one on the workshops that we ran and one on the NDIS Champions program that we ran, and I know we also have some funding applications in to try and extend that and uh, build on that. Um, and we will also be releasing the gap analysis that we actually did a couple of years ago, but that um, quite a number of people would like to have access to. So we'll be gradually releasing these resources on our Disability Loop e-news um, over the next couple of months. So if you've been waiting for these resources, because we've promised a few people they're coming, we're getting as good as the NDIA themselves with our imminence, it's imminent, it's imminent, um, then uh, keep an eye on the e-news um, because that'll be telling you where they are. And I brought a couple of copies of this one with me today if anyone would like to grab these. Our, so since then, um, we've been working on two projects. Um, I'll talk about the Victorian one second because it's probably of more interest to you. But I was just going to uh, let you know that uh, AFTO has received a grant from the National Disability Insu Insurance Agency to work with peer-led organisations to help them prepare for the national rollout of information linkages and capacity building. And so this project will build organisational capacity and readiness by looking at the needs of people with disability and their families and the ways in which ILC activities could meet those needs. We'll support organisations to engage with people with disability and or their families in consistent ways and will carry out individual and collective projects to help organisations get ready for ILC, including the development of useful tools and resources. AFTO will work closely with a range of peer-led organisations to understand their needs and to implement individual and collective projects throughout 2007 and early 2008, and we naturally will provide reports back to the NDIA. Um, the biggest part of that project will be with um, the big national peak organisations, but there will be um, some other work that we'll do with smaller organisations later this year and early next year. So again, I'd encourage you to stay connected to the Disability Loop e-news because that will be where we will talk about those things in more detail. Uh, the other project that we're working on at the moment is a project uh, funded by the Victorian Government uh, as together with a lot of Victorian-based organisations. Uh, on the NDIS transition support package. So the main thing that we're doing in that package is an extension of our understanding the NDIS workshops. 
um, that some of you attended as train the trainer workshops, we're now rolling those out directly to people with disability and families, mainly in regional Victoria. So my colleague Carl Thompson, who some of you might know, is currently in Bendigo uh, in his third day of workshops there. Um, and in fact, demand has been so high, we're running a second lot in Bendigo in March, although I regret to tell you that I think it's already fully subscribed as well. Um, however, I would say to you, <laughs> Uh, we did get phone calls from people after the first series was um, fully subscribed, uh, which somewhat disconcertingly said that we were discriminating against people, but we said, no, we were just full. Um, and they said, well, we're going to go and tell DHHS. We, we said, yes, that's fine, and behind said, thank you. <laughs> um, and they went and complained, and DSS said, OK, we'll fund you another series. So um, if you didn't get in, that's a plan of action. But also uh, DHHS have just informed us that they're going to fund some more. Some more. So we, we will shortly announce in the e-news that uh, we will also be going to other areas, most likely Warrigal, Warrnambool and Hamilton, and we'll probably do one in Melbourne East um, in June. So that's what else we're doing. We're also collaborating with the other um, organisations that have been funded under the Victorian NDIS transition support package. So that's organisations like Valid and uh, Youth Disability Advocacy Service and Women with Disabilities Victoria. So a lot of really great organisations. Um, and we're developing some materials with them as part of that project. And the one I really wanted to draw your attention to um, is a tip sheet that we're putting together. There's been a lot of feedback, you'll be very familiar with it, there's been a lot of feedback um, about the fact that the first plan process starts with a phone call. Um, that uh, the NDIA keep telling us um, pro that I, th I don't know whether I've got the number exactly right, but I think it's about 55% of people are quite happy to have things by phone call, so it's still actually the majority of people are reporting. Um, but it's still a very big, 45% is a really big percentage of people that don't want to have a phone call. Um, there are problems with people just being surprised that the phone call that just sounds like a conversation is actually the conversation. Um, there's, um, it's disconcerting when people with intellectual disability get a phone call directly. It's disconcerting when you get a phone call from a stranger who talks about insurance and maybe you want to hang up on them because that's what we usually do when people, strangers ring us to talk about insurance. So um, one of the things that was identified is that we need some sort of just straightforward information that says, are you going to get a phone call and what you, want, what you might want to do or think about before you get that phone call. So not the whole pre-planning process, which sort of is more detailed than that, but basically saying to people that, A, you expect a phone call. Um, it's OK to continue that phone call now if that's what you're comfortable with. It's OK to ask them to call back to a more convenient time or maybe when you've got someone with you and it's quieter and you can put them on loudspeaker and um, take notes. And it's OK to ask for a face-to-face -face meeting. Although understanding if you have a face-to-face -face meeting, then getting your plan might take a little bit longer. Um, noting that in NEMA, um, most things in northeast and Melbourne area, um, they're doing things face to face, but that's because that's a particular trial. That's not what that's not what's going to happen in the rest of the state or the country. So I have in my hand um, a hard copy of a thing at the moment that's called Getting Your First Plan Phone Call from the NDIS, um, and we're working with other organisations uh, to develop it. But we'd be really interested in your feedback. So I wanted to leave some of these here um, to, for you to write on. Um, and give back uh, or give us a call or scan an email to me um, by the end of next week, please. Um, and we'll incorporate that feedback into doing that. And then you'll see the tip sheet come out through AFTO and a number of other organisations will probably put it out all together. So I'll leave that here today as well. Um, oh, and just to mention that we, with the tip sheet, we'll have more pictograms on it. You'll know that the disability loop, um, you know, we always uh, support our words with pictures um, and they're in plain language. So we'll just, um, it's, it's not there yet, but because um, we were meeting with our Victorian colleagues yesterday and I was coming here today, we've rushed it out so that we can get some feedback from you. 
So, any questions on any of that before I sort of basically go into the content that I was asked to present on today? Good stuff. So, today I am talking more about local area coordination, support coordination, how that all links together, what that might mean for advocacy organisations. And I should push my... Ah, oh, there you go. That was my first slide, first plan tips sheet. And, in fact, I'm going to go to my, that, <laughs> to my local area coordinator slide first and go back to support coordination. So... Um, when the, in the NDIS uh, literature, because there's more and more NDIS literature coming out, there's, you know, there's better literature now than there was during the trial, that's for sure. Um, so in the, in the first plan uh, document, that's about eight or ten pages long, there's a page that says start your NDIS journey here. And when they talk about the NDIS journey, they talk about what is the NDIS? Can I access the NDIS? my first plan, where they, they emphasise that your first plan is the start of a lifelong relationship with the NDIS. Starting my plan, which says you can choose the providers you want, or you might need your existing provider to provide some supports for a while, and then reviewing my plan. Now, so far in a lot of the conversations that we have, there's been a lot of discussion, and you would find in advocacy, a lot of discussion about uh, access, can people get in and the problems that people might have getting in and my first plan and what we just talked about then in terms of the phone calls. But in fact, what I'm going to be talking about today is the starting my plan bit. So it's really the bit that, the, that was called um, plan implementation um, in the more corporate speak, but in the current stuff is called starting my plan. And in the starting... Uh, and the reason that we're concentrating on plan implementation or starting my plan is one of the things that came out of trial was that people managed to get through access, managed to get through planning, had a plan, and then 10 weeks later hadn't spent a dollar or 20 weeks later had barely spent anything. So people had a plan and then didn't know what to do. So um, either didn't have the skills or didn't have the confidence or didn't understand that once they had the, the, the document that, in fact, they could start purchasing things. And so the emphasis on starting my plan is actually about the getting going part. So when the uh, agency talks about starting my plan, they talk about self-direction. So they talk about you have control over your supports and how they're provided. So this is very much where the choice and control part of the NDI, you know, this is where choice and control is expected to dominate more than any other part of the scheme. You can choose your providers. You will normally need to make a written agreement with your providers to do this. They mention the participant portal, which is an online tool available through the MyGov website that keeps all of your documents together. So get people understanding that the way they sort of do the things with their plan happens through the MyGov portal. And of course, uh, very soon we'll all be talking to Nadia in the portal. I'm going to learn more about Nadia tomorrow. And you can think about your future goals. So it's important to think about how your first plan is working for you, what is good and what is not. So the things to note from that is that they talk about self-direction, choosing providers and the participant portal. But of course, there are many people who really can't do that. So one of the things, I don't know how many, are, are all of you are aware that the NDIS is streaming people as they come into the scheme? So what that means is as you access the scheme and go through the first plan process, the NDIS, the various um, people from the NDIS, whether it's a, lo a local area coordinator or whether it's a national access team that might call you or an information gatherer, whoever it is that first makes contact with a person with disability or their nominee, um, is making an assessment on how capable that person is to do the plan implementation because of what happened in trial. So one of the tasks of the people that first come in contact with the person with disability is to make an initial assessment about the level of support that they will that will be required from the NDIS to assist them through the planning and the plan implementation or the starting a plan process. 
And um, this is done to try and use the NDIS resources as, efficiency, as efficiently as possible. So they basically stream people into three streams. So the first stream is self-planning. So this is the participants who only need minimal support through the planning process and who are pretty able to implement the plan themselves. And this is expected to be about 10% of participants. Then there are, is the majority, which they call supported. So the participants who will need some level of support through the planning process, and that'll be 60 to 70% of participants. And then there's intensive. So participants who require a high level of support and are likely to need specialised providers to help them to implement and manage their plan. And this is expected to be around 20% of participants. And the numbers don't add up exactly because they're all a range. And an NDIS participant may change between those streams, uh, partly by telling the NDIS that they might need more or less support, or the NDIS themselves might identify that the poor person needs more or less support. And as I keep talking, that streaming becomes relevant when we start talking about local air coordination and support coordination. So the question is, what do LACs do? So local, unfortunately, the acronym LAC sometimes means local area coordinators, the people, and sometimes means local area coordination, the action. So I shall try not to use the acronym too much. But the LACs, so the local area coordinators, their job is to support NDIS type participants. Well, they have three main tasks. And the biggest part of their task is just to support NDIS participants. And that's no surprise because they are supposed to help people through access, they are supposed to help people through their first plan, and they are supposed to help people with their plan implementation. So that's a lot of work with participants. Then they're supposed to support every person with disability. So this is about providing supports for people with disability who are not eligible for the scheme or to get an individualised package through the scheme, but will still benefit from being a lot of the linkages or a lot of the same information or uh, need assistance in some way. But that, during the transition, will probably be about 10% of their job. And then they're supposed to do community development. So this is about helping the mainstream become more inclusive. Um, working with community organisations, service providers, to build inclusion, build awareness of the needs of people with disability that other people take for granted. Um, but so far, the reality is that really local area coordinators are spending most of their time with NDIS participants. Um, but we would very much hope, in the same way that the you know, Transport Accident Commission the long-term benefits of, um, you know, explaining to us about slowing down and wearing seat belts and what have you have actually changed driver behaviour, then in fact community behaviour, when we look back in 10 years' time or 15 years' time, we will actually see those differences. But I think the reality is for the next three years, it'll be mainly to do with the people with disability who are eligible for the scheme. So... That's what I just described there is sort of the ILC part of the, you know, the information linkages and capacity building part of the um, LAC's job where that really relates to getting plans started and helping people through. But also, the LAC will be the primary contact person for a per like the, the, the NDIS contact person for a person with disability, for that group that I just called supported. So for that 60 to 70% of people, that LAC is their main point of contact. So the LAC is the main point of contact for 60, 70% of people. The people, the 10 to 20% of people who self-manage, the LAC is actually still their prime first of contact, but really they're quite um, independent in the way they might go about it. And it's the people in the intensive screen, stream, that 20% of people, who will actually get support coordination in their plans. And they, their primary contact person is the support coordinator. So um, one of the things that um, the Daru team said to me when we were talking about this presentation is there's confusion about what the role of the, the, LA, the local area coordinator is relative to the support coordinator. But really it's a continuum. It starts sort of pretty independent, 
more and more dependence on an LAC, on a local area coordinator, and then gradually when in fact the no amount of support that someone needs is greater than what an LAC could be expected to provide, then we move into support coordination. So really, in some, when it comes to plan implementation, when it comes to starting your plan, the thing that the LAC, the, 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 the work of the LAC and the support coordinator, in some way, when I say they're similar, clearly the support coordinator, it's much more intensive and much more detailed and possibly much more specialised. So. Oh, and the other thing that the uh, LAC should do and possibly the support coordinator, is around risk assessments. So to make sure that there is enough, that there are safeguards in place and to make sure that the person has access um, to the things that they need to be safe. So, you know, that includes the, the stories that you hear of the 80-year-old parents coming, on, coming in with a 50-year-old with um, an intellectual disability and saying, we're all fine, we're all fine, everything's fine. And the LAC should look at it and go, actually, there's a risk that, that the support from the parents might disappear for reasons that the parents might not want to face up to. So uh, there's that sort of risk assessment all the way through to, you know, identifying a, 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 an abusive relationship or a gatekeeper um, in a planning situation. So... That is why when the, um, in the literature that the NDIS provides, again, all headed up starting my plan or starting your plan, they talk about once your plan is approved, it's time to put it in, into action. So their tips are read and understand your plan, register for MyGov and link to the NDIS participant portal, which is called My Place, and then connect with a person who will help you start your plan. So that's a bit we're talking about. So you've either got to meet and talk over the phone with a local area coordinator. So again, that's the continuum. For people that only need a little bit of support, they'll get telephone support from an LAC. For someone who needs more support, they should be getting a face-to-face -face meeting from an LAC. Uh, or if you are under seven, then in fact your key contact person will be the early childhood partner. So the early childhood, early inter intervention partner. But then, so that's for people who are starting their plan with a local area coordinator. So they give you a whole lot of literature about what you might do in terms of talking to your local area coordinator. And then they would talk, the other thing they do is to talk about a support coordinator. So that's a different set of, a different set, it's a very similar set of things, but there's an assumption that your situation will be more complex if you're talking to a support coordinator. So, what does that mean? for advocacy agencies in terms of support coordination. So this comes back to the scenario where it's possible that advocacy agencies already do some of this complex navigation. That already you get, you know, it, the calls to advocacy agencies are most likely to be from the people in the most complex situations with the most intensive communication needs or support needs. And so probably it's highly likely that the group of people that you might be in contact with are the people who meet that 20% are that 20% of people who need more intensive supports. It's not always the case, but it's often the case. So the tricky position that advocacy agencies are in is that this support is now provided through a plan. So advocacy itself is still funded separately, so through the National Disability Advocacy Program. But this particular thing that advocacy agencies do in terms of helping people in complex situations navigate the system, that's funded in a plan. And because it's funded in a plan, the only way for an agency to get paid for that work is to be a registered provider of supports. Now, they talk, uh, you may well know that you can self, uh, people can self-manage a plan and in, if they self-manage a plan, then they can choose a provider that's not a registered provider of supports, but for, for support coordination, you're expected to be a registered provider of supports. 
partly because of conflict of interest issues for other service providers. So, in the NDIS provider update of September 2016, they talk about first plans and support coordination. So first plans for people receiving support coordination focus on participants' immediate needs. It's expected that support coordination will assist the participant to implement and monitor their plan, as well as working with the participant to develop their goals prior to second plan and the supports required to achieve them. Building current capacity and encouraging participants to explore different supports and linking participant with mainstream and community supports. So the role of support coordination is, the primary role is to support implementation and identify options for all supports in the plan, including informal, mainstream and community, as well as funded supports, to strengthen and enhance the participants' abilities to coordinate supports and participate in the community, reach decisions and develop agreements with support providers. So the NDIS is hoping that people will use support coordination but it will actually build their capacity to, for example, need less support which could then be provided through an LAC, a local area coordinator, and that the LAC should be building the, the capacity of people with disability to implement their own plans and so basically maybe eventually some more, a high proportion of people will self-manage their plans. So the NDIS is hoping that there will be a move or what, you know, that to, in fact support coordinators are tasked with the job of doing themselves out of a job. That, that, but of course there are some people, and in fact there are quite a lot of people, who are in very complex situations and will always need support coordination. They're expected to ensure that mainstream services meet their obligation, so housing, education, justice, health, etc. So that doesn't enable the mainstream systems to push the person with disability back to the NDIS and say, no, we're not going to help you, you've got to get that support through NDIS. It's to help the person say, no, you actually have to provide me with this support. I'm entitled to an inclusive education even though I'm an NDIS participant and I don't have to use part of my NDIS package to be included in education, for example. To build the capacity of the participant to achieve greater independence, self-directed supports in the longer term and understand funding, funding flexibility. So this is this thing where you get budgets in your plan and that even though your budget's got one thing against it, you're allowed to spend it on similar things. So it's one of the complexities in the whole transport stuff at the moment that uh, if you have, an, if in your core support you have transport but you also have um, personal, you know, personal care, in fact you can use some of those things interchangeably. So you can use more of your personal care budget to supplement your transport budget. Not that that's great. Not that you actually want to take less personal care so that you can get around. Uh, be available. So the, per the support coordinator needs to be available to ensure that new support arrangements endure and in times of crisis. So this is the bit that the LAC can't do. The local area coordinators pulled a thousand different directions at once. Um, going to be hard to catch them on the phone. The support coordinators are supposed to be available so that if crisis hits, they can help people with a short time around and provide NDIA with reports. So the way that support coordination is allocated, if you're a provider, the NDIA, once the plan's approved, the NDIA contacts the participant for the preferred support coordinator. So if the participant has already identified a, a support coordinator, they will nominate that. If not nominated, NDIA will allocate, and that's via random selector. The NDIA sends a copy of the participant plan and a request for service, and it completes the service booking, and the service coordinator must meet with the participant within five working days. So that's the, the, that's the um, what, what, what's expected of you as a support coordination. The, you get a request for service, so when you get the request for service, you get the participant's detail, the name, the NDIS number, plan start date, contact details, preferred contact person. You should get, this is you being the support coordinator, should get information on what support is required, which include barriers, immediate connections required and other informal and mainstream connections, and you should get told of what the reporting requirements are 
and you must have explicit policies in place to manage any conflicts of interest, and you must maintain records that demonstrate potential real conflicts are managed appropriately for each in participant. And for those of you who have heard me speak before, you will have heard us speak quite strongly about the conflict of interest that exists for service providers. It's one of the reasons that um, advocacy agencies um, find themselves in a position of thinking about becoming support coordinators is because of the conflict of interest for service providers. That if you're doing support coordination, so you're enabling a participant to exercise choice and control of their provider, and you work for a provider that provides a lot of things, you've got to be really careful that the person doesn't walk out the support coordination door and in the day service door down the corridor. That you really have to, you know, for providers, they really have to demonstrate that they are managing that conflict of interest. Now, there's different conflict of interest for advocacy in terms of you might be advocating, you might be um, in a situation where you're advocating to the agency for a particular participant, but at the same time negotiating their support coordination. And so, as an agency, you would need to have um, processes in place to manage that. But the reason that they go on about conflict of interest in particular is about the conflict of interest for a service, for a service provider who provides other, other, other services that the participant might want to um, access. And then, then, the, then there's a whole lot of information about service agreements and we get into the detail there. So when you look at the price guide, um, you can see that there's three levels of support coordination, which again is expected to be a continuum. So one is called support connection. So that, well, the top is no support, no assistance required. Then support connection is some assistance required to start the plan, to link to providers and monitor, monitor plan progress. And that's called support connection. And usually we particularly saw this in Barwon where people had maybe 10 hours or so in their plan and it really just enabled that little bit of uh, support at the beginning. Then there's support coordination and that's assistance to start the plan, monitor the plan, including active plan, Management's probably the wrong word because it's different to the financial plan management and address barriers. And then there's specialist support coordination, which is like the other two with a requirement for a specialised framework necessitated by specific high-level risks and needs. But the message from the agency, when I look to try and get someone else to come and help me do this presentation, the message from the agency was that we will see a distinct decrease in support connection in plans that we're not going to see a lot of support connection in plans because really that's going to be the role of the local area coordinator. So we're going to see fewer and fewer plans with support connection in them and we're particularly going to see a decrease in support connection in the trial sites. So for us that means Barwon because in the trial sites there wasn't local area coordination. So for people who needed some support, they needed at least support connection. But there's a very strong overlap between the work of the local area coordinator and support connection. Um, and so uh, they're not, they didn't say to me that there won't be any support connection, but they are expecting to see a significant decrease. So I think that's also, if you're already a provider in Darwin, to be aware, Barwon, to be aware of that. Then you've got the support coordination level and the specialist coordination. The other thing is they're expecting an increase in the need for support coordination and they're particularly seeing an increase in the need for specialist support coordination. So for people who need, um, so who are in complex situations, who are in contact with child protection or in contact with the justice system, those, those complex situations, they are ex at the moment, I think there's a worry that there will not be enough support coordinators to do that more complex work. So there's a way, for, there's a just really strong message that we're moving away from the more, the simpler connection work and moving towards the more time con consuming complex work. So then you go to the price guide and you look at your own organisation and you think, can we provide this service if we decide to register as a, as a support? And the registration group that you need to be aware of is the 0106 registration group, which is on page 10 of the Provider Toolkit Module 4. So if you're thinking of becoming a provider, you need to go onto the NDI's website and go through all of the provider information 
which again has improved markedly since trial, um, and you need to look at the provider toolkit. But in there it talks about the registration group called Assistance in Coordinating or Managing Life Stages, Transition and Supports. So it's called, for short, Life Stage, comma, Transition. And this registration group includes long and short term supports that focus on strengthening the participants' ability to coordinate their supports and to assist them to live at home and participate in their community. And this includes support connection, coordination of supports, assistance with accommodation and tenancy obligations, life transition planning, including mentoring, peer support and individual skill development, and assistance with decision making, daily planning and budgeting. And the professions, so that your staff will be expected to be disability support workers, welfare, any combination of disability support worker, welfare worker, developmental educator, social worker, welfare worker, that's mentioned twice, or other care worker. But it matters when we move into the specialised stuff because it's in a different group. So, I'm going to get there. So, support coordination, the specialised support coordination. So, this is where it gets a bit tricky because I'm suspecting that the people that you see in your agencies are actually possibly the most complex. But the provision of support coordination within a specialist framework necessitated by specific high level risks in the participant situation. So it's likely to be behaviours of concern, it's likely to be contact with justice, likely to be child protection, maybe it might be a parent with a disability and a child with a disability, whatever the complex situation is. Um, the support is, is time limited but focuses on addressing barriers and reducing complexity in the support environment while assisting the participant to connect with supports and build capacity and re resilience. And it may also involve development of an intervention plan which will be put in place by disability support workers. And in this case, it's a different registration group. It's called 0132. And in this case, there's um, a higher threshold um, in terms of the professions. They're more likely to be psychologist, occupational therapist, social worker, other allied health developmental educator, social or health science professionals. So... You can do your support coordination with a team made up of advocates who have a lot of lived experience, but you can't do the specialised work without having someone with one of those qualifications. So allied health, psychologist. So that will, de you know, for, for an agency that will depend. And I think one of the reasons that they're concerned about having, not having enough of the specialised uh, support coordinators is because because of that higher threshold, because you need to have people with that, um, basically it's a degree level of training rather than a certificate three or certificate four or lived experience. That's really the difference. Um, and then from there you look at the price guide. So um, again, instead of being bulk funded, so through your NDAP sort of funding, you'd be funded, you'd be invoicing through a, a person's plan um, you'd have to have a service agreement with the, with the participant that says what you charge. And support connection, which is the one that I'm saying will be reduced. The unit price for that currently is $56.61. Coordination of support, so that's per hour. Coordination of supports is $92.27. And the specialist... One, I always have to go and find. I've lost it again. It's 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 higher again. It's the last I knew was one hundred and ninety-two dollars, but I think it's changed since. Um, yeah, oh, one hundred ninety-two dollars seventy-one. I think is where it's at. So. At the moment, there's no training specifically to become a support coordinator. I believe, well, I have seen one online and I went to Google it when I came here and I couldn't find it again, so I didn't know whether I imagined it. Um, so it's not specific training. Um, with the specialist stuff, it's controlled by the quality control mechanisms of being a member of the professional bodies, the allied health bodies or the psychi psychologist bodies or anything like that. Um, 
And so it's not a particular course on its own at this point in time. So it's a big, it's a big thing to think about whether or not um, that might be a direction that will go in. But as I said, when I um, was looking to even possibly have someone from the agency come with me today, um, that the very strong message was uh, we need more and we need more in the most complex areas. And um, the unspoken hope was that maybe there'll be further action in the ad advocacy sector moving in that direction. I'm open to questions at this point. <coughs> Say that again. Are you talking about the support coordinators? Microphone. I do think, I'm Eve by the way, I brought an article in which I thought was beneficial, but I do think they need to be educated because we are going to have an increase of people who have a disability and who well and truly the NDIS, and they are going to have trouble funding us. Yes, that's true. So they do need to be educated. I would like to know how we are going to educate them. Yes, well, I do believe that's why you'll find there's a lot of subsidies at the moment for people doing disability support worker work and allied health and psychologists. They're trying to get more people to go to university and do those courses. There's another hand up over here. Is the stating process the same or different for a person already on an IS plan who has been self-managing for years? Sorry, I missed the very beginning of the sentence. Is the what process? Is the stating process the same or different for a person already on an IS plan who has been self-managing for years? Sorry, I've still missed the word before process. The very the beginning. The what? Screening. Screening. The screening process? Yet. Yeah. Um. Starting. Yep. Yeah. Oh, the starting process. Right. Thank you. Um, no. So if you're already on a plan, if you're already getting supports, the NDIS will contact you when your area comes in bo on board. And if you tell them you've been self-managing, they'll pretty much straight away say you're in the self-management area unless you tell them that you don't want to. But if you've been self-managing for years and if you've been doing that well, then you would expect to go. They would. Uh, you would expect them to straight away say that that would continue. I've heard that the invoice and payment process is more complicated because of different rates. Uh, yeah, well, that's different to the starting process. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so you're, the starting process is supposed to be reasonably simple, that if you have a state 
state-based package and you're getting supports state, that basically the state gives your information to the NDIS and then when they ring you, they basically confirm that information is correct and um, they'll be looking at your existing package as a starting point. And so when you come into the NDIS, you can say whether or not um, you need, you know, whether your package is fulfilling all your needs or whether you need more or less or whatever you need. So you can do that. So that process should be relatively simple, although, of course, as we keep reiterating, is likely to start on the phone. But, of course, when you go through access, you can talk about your preferred communication method and you can say that it needs to be face-to-face -face if that's what you need. Uh, in terms of the portal, interacting with the portal, the rules between the state system and the NDIS, some people have found them to be different and some people report easier and some people report harder. So, in this case, I have a colleague who self-managed on the state system and who's now in the NDIS and he's fairly blasé about it. He, he hasn't... But he was actually on the... Um, oh, I've forgotten all my acronyms. Uh, well, the disability DSR, the Disability Support Register, he actually did not... He only had a very, very small package. And so, in fact, coming into the NDIS has been wonderful. He's very happy to put up with the portal because he gets the extra supports. Um, there, there are some things that are a bit more flexible. They, there, it seems to be there are some things that are more flexible, some things that are less flexible. It is not exactly the same. That is true. Um, and I've only got a relatively small sample size of people who have been self-managing who say that it's okay. So they say there is a little bit of adapting. Um, and that, for example, um, there might be less flexibility. So, for example, people might have been using their self-funded packages to buy memberships for a footy team or something like that. Or there's some flex, you know, to, in terms of their social and community participation. That sort of stuff won't be allowed on a plan anymore. But on the other hand, people rarely had enough money for consumables, for uh, continence aids or for other consumables. They rarely had enough money in their package for that. So now they do have enough money in their package for that. So a lot of people have reported swings and roundabouts. You get a bit less flexibility here, but we're actually getting something else properly funded. So now we can actually afford to buy our own tickets because we're not having to spend all our other money on our disability-related supports. So hearing a bit of both. With the local area coordinators and the support coordinators, do the participants get to keep them on a regular basis? Like, are they their uh, contact or...? Well, certainly on a regular basis, it would depend on your definition of regular. So, for if for an... That's one of the differences between the two. Oh, do they change? Oh, well, that'll be a staff turnover thing. So, the organisation won't change. Um, in terms of uh, who your support coordinator is or who your provider of your support coordinator... Sorry, provider of your LAC coordinator or your provider of your support coordinator won't change with the contracts. So, at the moment, I think they've been given three-year contracts. I can't remember. Two or three-year contracts. Well, it depends on which jurisdiction you're in, whether or not the LAC has a two- or three-year contract. Um, and same with the support coordinators. So there are some organisations that are very small who are coming into support coordination where really it's this often sort of a well-known advocate or well-known person in the sector and it depends on them. That person's not going to change much. If it's support coordination provided by Urella, then maybe it is. I think it's a hard question to answer because really it's about staff turnover as much as it is about anything else. But certainly I would think that that could be a competitive advantage to a... Uh, advocacy agency where you tend to have um, very low staff turnover and people, the same people. But the, the idea is that um, the, per the participant does develop relationships that are consistent. Yeah. It, that, that, is, that, is, that is the... Uh, for both, there is that intention that there will be some level of consistency so that you are talking about the same person with your plan, then when you go to review your plan, you're talking to the same person again and you have this ongoing relationship and... Uh, and, and that, but that's the idea. But the reality of, st you know, this, these are all professional positions, paid positions, people move jobs. Yeah. So it really depends on that. Thank you. Uh, 
Right. What, what does the uh, NDIS package involve? How, what, what are they allowed to spend on? A person with disability. Mm -hmm. So it's on your disability related need. So it means that you can get the support you need because of your disability that other people that don't have a disability don't need. So the NDIS will, support, will pay for um, personal support. So if you need help with your person, you know, to get in and out of bed to, and, and that sort of thing, they'll support, pay for that. They'll pay for equipment, specialised equipment that you need to give you access to the community. And um, they'll uh, pay for some of your personal development. That's what they, when they talk about capacity they're building, they mean making you more able to do things by yourself um, but that you haven't learned how to do because of your disability. So you might not have learnt something because you've got an intellectual disability or you might not be able to do something because see something or hear something, so you might need some extra supports. But it's the ones because of your disability. So one of your, your classic examples is swimming lessons that other people in the community have to pay for their own swimming lessons or their own kids' swimming lessons, so the NDIS will not pay for swimming lessons. But if you need a person to be with you to help you learn to swim because of your physical, um, you know, you might have a physical condition that you can't float and so you need a person with you, or you might have an intellectual disability, whatever, if you need a support person with you, then they'll pay for that. So it's your disability related supports. That's what the NDIS, and then there's a reasonable amount of flexibility in there, okay. but it must be related to your disability, not just things that you want from you. It's not everything you want for your life. And also, one last question, not question. I brought in an article. I would suggest that you watch what they do because that was an important, important article that I brought in and I thought that you have to watch the government because they could start straddling along with the NDIS money and it's important that we all have that, that, that the people who have a disability and really depend on it need it. That's right. We do need to keep a keep a careful eye on it because the government have made a couple of changes and we need to be very, very careful that's that the NDIS I'd keeps going as it was promised. Absolutely. Well, I agree with I you 100%. Thank you very much. I believe that I'm out of time. I think we have time for one more question before okay. we go to a break. And just a reminder, all the resources that Catherine has referred to today will be available on our website later. And we will send out an email to everyone registered today when it's all ready. So one more question. Will NDIS cover work-based assistance? I don't believe so. You possibly have to talk. When you talk about a work-based assessment, it depends what you're talking about. Sorry? Oh, assistance. Sorry, I thought you said assessment. Uh, it depends. So when you're working, if you... There's a thing called uh, the Job Access Program or Employment Assistance Program that if you uh, get work and then you need assistance to help you access the work environment or whatever, that it will help you pay. So for example, um, I have a colleague who uses a wheelchair and when he, was, he started working at AFTO, we needed to get a self-opening door so he could get in and out the door. No, no, I know what you're saying. I'm just drawing, I'm telling the longer story. So that, and the reason they paid for that, that that was completely related to work. If you, and so you get your work-related assistance through a program like that and the NDIS will not pay for that sort of work assistance. But if you need assistance to access anything, so to get to work, to get to school, to get to the community, to get, you know, you need it all the time no matter what you're doing, then that's your disability-related need. So that's why I told the story. There are some things that are, are just related to work and there are some things that are related to your whole life. Now, I can't tell you exactly what's going to be funded and not funded because it depends on you and your situation and what happens in the plan, but basically that's what they do. If you need it for your whole life because it's your disability-related support, then it's much more likely to be approved in a plan. So you need a wheelchair to get anywhere, then it's not a workplace-related thing. But you need something like the self-opening door. But, of course, then you end up with all this 
staff because my colleague organised for the same provider to provide the self-opening door that provides the self-opening door at his home, so therefore he only has to have one uh, remote switch on his uh, wheelchair and it opens the work door and the home door. So you can then, that's with your choice and control, you can be smart about the way that you line things up to make life more easy for yourself as well. I hope that makes sense. Okay, great. Thank you, Catherine. We'll now... Um, we will now have a quick break and we'd like everyone to be back here at 20 past two to start the State Disability Plan and the update with the Office for Disability. Thank you.